uh, studying in the book of Psalms. And I believe that this uh, book is the uh, all-time favorites around the world, those who are following and studying the Word of God. And Psalm is also so dear to many of us because we can relate to the prayers, to the cry, to the sing, or the song of the psalmist. That's why when I decided that, Lord, what do you want us to study or to hear from you or to learn from you, especially after finishing a book in the Old Testament in Habakkuk, what's next, Lord? And my heart was drawn to this psalm in terms of our study this morning. And Lord willing, for the next coming few uh, weeks or Sundays, it will be focusing on the Psalms. But this time, this is my focus, uh, the focus of our study this morning, desiring God, how to quench our thirst for Him. It's good when uh, Stephen kicked off by starting the question, why do you think God is worthy of praise or worship? And then Rebecca just said, why not? Because he is worthy of worship. And as we come to the Lord, as we come to this gathering, not just to coming to the church building, what are you expecting? What are you longing for to be quenched when you are coming before him? Because one way or the other, we are approaching God that in in a way that we are thirsty for something. But I hope that we are thirsting for Him. Not thirsting for anything but God Himself. Because there are times that when we go to church, is it like just, I just want to feel guilt free so that this coming Monday to Friday, I'll be able to work well and focus on my work because I have ticked the box that I went to church and I have studied the Word of God. But this time, I just want to invite you in this and fix your attention as I read Psalm 63, verses 1 to 11. And this one, I would like to read this in a fresh uh, from the Oban in terms of uh, the translation because it will be coming from the Legacy Standard Bible, wherein we are, it's like, they are the scholars or the translators of this uh, Legacy Standard Bible is they want to capture the literal translation of the Hebrew from the Hebrew to English or from Aramaic to English or from Greek to Aramaic or from Greek to English because they just want not only it will be readable but their goal is they want to present to the reader and to the study as a student of the word of god on what really god mean when he spoke his word so I just want to invite you in psalm 63 verses 1 to 11 and this will be in the psalm of david a psalm of david when he was in the wilderness of judah verse 1 O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In a dry and weary land without water, thus I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will laud you. Thus I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with fatness and richness, and my mouth offers praises with lips of joyful songs. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. But the king will be glad in God. Everyone who swears by him will boast. For the mouths of those who speak lies will be closed. Our Heavenly Father, 
we know and we believe that this is your word spoken through the mouth of David. And we pray, Father, that may you continue to guide us as you have guided David to pen, to write this word through the power of your Holy Spirit. May you guide us. May you help me. May you guide me, Lord, so that the very breath that you have put in my lungs will pour out worship, praise, adoration to you, and that your people will be strengthened, that our thirst for you, Lord, will be quenched. Thank you so much, Father, because we know that your help is always available and that you are here in our midst, that you will continue to bring us what we need. Especially, Lord, we want you, Lord. We need the guidance and the help, the wisdom coming from your Holy Spirit. May you speak to us. May you speak through me. For your name's sake, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Desiring God. And this is the way that we can say, I, I think for us, this is the, the question, how? How are we going to quench our thirst for him? I remember what John Piper said in, in his um, podcast or uh, the tagline of Desiring God. Because when we desire God, it is like, God is glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Because when we are thinking of this and when we are coming before God and hungering and thirsting for Him, we have this promise, we have this assurance when God said, or when the Lord Jesus Christ said in His famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he said, Blessed, happy are those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will fill them, those who are hungering and thirsting for him. And with this, as we study, uh, maybe when you are reading with me this psalm, Maybe some of you are not familiar with this, or some of you are um, maybe memorize this, or this is your first time to hear this psalm. Maybe you're thinking about, wow, David is in the wilderness. Because coming from the superscription, superscription, when you have in your Bible, the, the maybe the top of it, the introduction to the chapter, it's not guided or inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is an additional, addition by the translators. And then what they are saying here, it's based on the history that this psalm was written when David was in the wilderness of Judah. And maybe if you are familiar with the life and the story of David, there are two instances wherein he fled to the wilderness in Judah. That was the first time when King Saul was hunting him because people or because Saul is developing jealousy towards David. And that's the time wherein he wants to kill David because he was a threat to the throne. And that's why maybe the scholars are saying that David wrote this when he was running away from King Saul. But maybe others are saying in 2 Samuel that David maybe is running away from Absalom. Absalom was the son of David. And that was the time when Absalom wants to get the throne away from his father, David. And when you are seeing this picture, or maybe uh, I cannot say that the right 
time or the timing of this uh, writing was when he was running away from King Saul or he was running away from his son Absalom. But what I can say here that when he wrote this, he was in the wilderness. <laughs> and when you are in the wilderness, maybe some of you have experienced going to the desert land or barren land that you cannot see anything but dirt or dry ground. And then that's the time that you will feel the thirst because of the scorching heat of the sun. And when you feel that, that's the time that you will be longing for water. Oh, how I wish I had this water. And when you are in that situation, maybe even in the Bible, when you hear the word desert or wilderness, it's also a metaphor for those who are experiencing difficulties, trials, and, difficult, and, and problems, tribulations in life, challenges, maybe. Because in wilderness, you cannot see any life. Maybe in your situation right now, you can see any life or hope. That's why I, am, I have this confidence that this message from the Word of God through David in Psalm 63 can and will encourage your heart and not only warm your soul, but it will also quench your thirst for him. And maybe if you are questioning yourself right now, uh, why am I not hungering or thirsting for God? And if you are in that situation right now, this message as well is for you. Because we're going to find four ways or four guides or maybe four glasses of water on how we can quench our thirst for God. If you're not thirsting for him or even if you are thirsting for him, this message is for you. Just like what we can see again in this first verse, first two verses. Because I want you to know that this one, this first guide or ways in order for you to quench your thirst for God is to relish God. And when I am using this, because I just want it to be all in letter R so that you will capture and remember this, Pinky says, relish, it's like food, relish. And this is a metaphor because David is using a metaphor here and I would like to use this metaphor as well. For you to capture it, are you relishing God? Are you desiring Him? Because if you don't have that desire, if you don't have that longing or thirst for Him, why will you drink water? I remember the time when we were about to climb the Mount Sinai, and our tour guide said, hey guys, I want you to grab your water first. And in grabbing the water, I want you to drink as much as you can. And others are saying, we're not thirsty yet. He said, if you are about to drink when you're thirsty, it is too late. You need to drink water first and don't wait for you to feel the thirst because it will be too late. So now you need to desire water before you grab it, before you feel the need of it. We need to have this we need to relish God above anything, above anyone else. That's why look with me in verse 1 and verse 2. It says, O oh God, you are my God. This chapter 63, the book of Psalms has five divisions. From Psalm 1 to Psalm 150, the the organizer or the scholars, as they look at it, that there are five divisions based on this book. And they're saying, why five divisions? Maybe they're saying, maybe they relate it to the Torah, which is the five books of the law of Moses. But here, when you look at this, this is in, even in your headings, in your Bible, it started, this, the book one started from chapter 1 to 41, and then chapter 40, 42 to 72, you can see the book number 2. Book 1 started by, blessed is a man whose desire, or who desires the word of God, who meditates the word of God day and night. The blessed man the, who meditates the word of the Lord. 
But in chapter 42, the second, the beginning of the second book, you can see here why they said in the uh, Sons of Korah says, as a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after you, O God. You will see many, O God, than Lord, because this is like they said, it's a hell Elohistic or Elohim passage or book number two. They're pertaining to God as Elohim, the mighty one, the creator, the all-powerful one. So when David penned this, he started by saying, Oh God, you are my God. It's like the literal one, Oh God, you are my almighty one. I shall seek you earnestly. Other translation in the authorized in King James, they translated, they translated it that I will seek you early or early will I seek you. But here, it's not only pertaining to the timing or the time of the day, but earnestly it means like you are my priority. That's why I will seek you earnestly. And the question for us right now is, the pursuit of God, our priority. Are we setting an alarm clock because I want to meet God and relish Him and enjoy Him? Or are we just setting an alarm clock so that we can get up and prepare for us to go to work or for us to go to school? I tried doing that now because I said, yeah, I'm setting an appointment or an alarm, an alert when I'm meeting someone. But why not set my alarm because I'm about to meet God? And I don't want to put, uh, to put guilt on you because when I'm starting doing that, I remember the time, the day that I had two or three appointments. Two for two guys, and the third, uh, the, the third one is my appointment with God. And to my shame, I put an alarm with these three appointments and I miss my appointment with the Lord because I'm just, okay, Lord, can I just move my appointment with you? Because this guy, I need to meet him. I need to talk to him. And then after a while, before the end of the day, I said, Lord, forgive me. I set an alarm so that I will not miss my appointment, but with the three appointments, I miss my appointment with you. And I'm just saying, Lord, you can forgive me, right? But these three, two guys, maybe, they will just say, oh, oh, look at Jim, he is not a man of his word. But how about God? And I'm guilty of that because I said, Lord, earnestly, I want to seek you earnestly, and yet, Looking at my action, I'm not really earnestly seeking you. I'm not relishing you. And when David said this, he shifted his metaphor by saying, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. In what way David is thirsting and relishing or, or yearning for God? It is like in a dry and weary land without water. It is like where I am right now. David is saying, like here in the wilderness of Judah, I am thirsting for you. I'm yearning for you. Remember, if you will not quench your thirst physically, you're going to die. But how about spiritually? When we are not relishing or when we are not desiring, when we are not quenching our thirst spiritually, we are going to soon decline. Maybe die in that sense that we are no longer desiring God. We're no longer needing Him. We're no longer like, I'm okay. I'm okay not to earnestly seek Him. Looking at my day, my calendar, looking at it, that i place God there, but I think I didn't even pay attention. I didn't even relish him. And that's the first way for us to look at this. 
Because when David said this, I yearn for you, I thirst for you, and thus, in verse 2, thus, because of this, I have beheld you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Remember, the temple was built not by David, but by Solomon. So it's not, he's not pertaining to the temple here. He's pertaining to a place wherein he can place this sacred time with the Lord. And the sanctuary is, is putting where you can place yourself as a holy place with the Lord. Your table, the chair can be a holy place wherein you can use that. My car right now is my sanctuary because it's a place wherein I can devote, devote my time with the Lord and be with Him and talk to Him. What is our sanctuary? A place where you can earnestly seek the Lord and relish Him and enjoy Him. So if we are not relishing or if we are not desiring God, there's no way that you can say your thirst for Him will be quenched. And aside from this, not only that you will relish God, this is another food or this is another term, uh, letter R, a way, another way for you to desire or to quench your thirst. The second one is to rave for God. Rave for God. In my accent, it's so difficult for me to emphasize the V. Rave or rave. Closing it, the B, boy, but rave for God. And when I ask my kids, hey, guys, what do you think when you hear the word rave? And they have, there's, uh, there are two, mes- uh, two definitions of that. But I think one definition of this word is so good because when you look at this, it's like praise enthusiastically. Remember when there is a review, the critics are raving for this movie or for this celebrity. They are praising enthusiastically, the critics. But the question for us, we who are adoring, we who are following the Lord, are we raving for Him? Are we praising Him continually, talking endlessly about Him, about His greatness? And for David, this is what he said. In verse 3, he said, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will laud or will praise, will adore, will rave you. Do we have that excitement when we talk about God? Do we have that raving or do we have that enthusiasm when we talk about Him? Ask the guys, or you can see those guys who are in love with their girlfriend or boyfriend other you will see that wow he's in love you can see the sparkle when they are talking about him or talking about her or talk to a guy a married guy or a married woman who's not raving after their spouse oh, yeah he's just there oh she's there there's no enthusiasm there's no life and yet for david He said, because of your loving kindness, you've heard me many times when you are following my teaching here, that this loving kindness, this word chesed, with a guttural chesed in Hebrew, it means the covenant love of God. Because of your covenant love, your covenant love is better than life. My lips, my mouth will laud, will praise, will rave for you. I'm not going to stop talking about you. I'm not going to stop praising, adoring you publicly and even privately. Remember this word in the popular Psalm 23. Only or surely goodness and loving kindness and chesed will follow me all the days of my life. Why is it that David said this, that your loving kindness is better than life? Not my toy is better than life. Not my spouse is better than life. Not my things or my achievement is better than life. He says that your loving kindness, your chesed, your your covenant love, your loyal love is better than life. Because David himself said 
that your loving kindness endures forever. Because the loyal covenant love of God endures better, will not only be felt and enjoy and experience here in this life, but also in the next life. That is the loving kindness. That is the chesed of God. That's why he said, it is better than anything, than my work, than my, my school, than my, any achievement that I can achieve. That's why my lips will laud, will praise, will glorify, will rave you. Thus, I will bless you as long as I live. When I'm studying the life of David, listening to my audio Bible, so that's why if you are busy, you don't have any excuse not to read or listen to the Word of God because there are many ways for you to devour, to relish, to rave the Word of God. I can see and I have discovered and noticed that He is just like us, just like me, imperfect. But one thing that is so unique and so admirable in the life of David is that his love for God. We've seen, him, uh, we've seen, we've seen David last week in Psalm 53 and 51 when he confesses sin against the Lord. Not only against Bathsheba or her husband, but against the Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned. He was so disappointed and desperate because he disappointed God. He sinned against God. That's admirable to David. That never in his life that he become this idolatrous worshiper of other God. No, his heart is towards God. Even though he's not a good dad, a good husband, but he is a worshiper. That's why he's a God after a man after God's own heart. He says, Thus I will bless you as long as I live. And this is what we are not practicing. I will lift up my hands in your name. I will lift up your hands. Maybe because of our tradition, maybe because of our upbringing, or maybe because of uh, we are not used to praising our hands or raising our hands, praising the Lord with our hands. But in the Old Testament time and even in the New Testament, the way they present or the way they express their worship to God is by raising their hands. Raising hands is like a gesture of worship and also a ge gesture of surrender, right? In the police scene when you're watching, raise up your hands. You need to surrender. And I think this kind of gesture that's why in my picture, maybe many of my pictures, I will just say to Pinky, let's have the praise shot. We just want to raise our hands. Raising our hands, expressing, Lord, we're so thankful that we are this, in this place. Lord, I'm so thankful and praising you because I have my wife with me in this place. Expressing my adoration, expressing my appreciation and I'm raving for God. I will lift up my hands in your name. So this expression of surrender, or this expression of worship is only pertaining to God himself. And then he said, another metaphor, my soul is satisfied with fatness and richness. Wow. Wow. Uh, we are trying, uh, Pink and I are one time trying a dish from the Philippines that we love, like adobo. Maybe you've heard that. And she said, why is it that when we are cooking this, the meat here in Australia is good, and yet it's not that delicious, as, just like in the Philippines. And then we only discover because we are removing the fats. And the fats is the one that gives like mm, richness. But this one, other translated this as the marrow or the bones in the marrow, the, the, the meat or something, the, the oil or the fat inside the bone. That's really good. That's what David is pertaining here. He's just like, there is satisfaction 
just like when you are feasting for food. The richness and the fatness of this, I'm so satisfied. And my mouth offers praises with lips of joyful songs. Right? Because when we are satisfied, when we go to the buffet, the buffet, and then we'll, uh, if you made the right choice, you will be rejoicing. You will be, you will feel the satisfaction. But if you will get all the carbs, donuts here, uh, potato here, and then pizza here, and then all of a sudden, I just can't put anything because I'm already filled, I'm already full. All the carbs are here, and the good, these, the meat, the fat maybe. I don't have any satisfaction because I gathered or I collected the carbs, not the fatness or not the richness of the food. The same thing with our worship or adoration with God. There are times that we don't have the energy to worship Him late at night because we were raving, binging on the movies that, that doesn't give any satisfaction. Do you feel one, uh, have you experienced that when you are so uh, maybe bored and just like looking for something to watch and then, okay, instead of getting, raving for God, relishing for Him, we yield to the temptation, and then before going to bed, you just want to enjoy God, but you're groaning because you said, Lord, maybe I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. And then I just want to sleep and rest. That's why we don't feel any spiritual or satisfaction our soul is not satisfied because we tried to relish or to rave for something else than the Lord himself. And for David, not only that he's relishing, not only that he's raving for God, the reason why he can rave for God because he remembers God. That's why here in the next or the third, the third steps for us or the third ways for us to quench our thirst is to remember God. In verse 6, he said this, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. I meditate on you in the night watches. When we look at this, maybe we can see that David is just like, I'm not only seeking you earnestly or early in the morning, but even in the night watches, I meditate on you. I meditate on you in the night watches. For in verse 7 and 8, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. Firstly, when we look at this in verse 6, you will not end up raving for God or praising and lauding for God without you remembering what He has done, remembering His loving kindness in your life. When you remember Him, you cannot help it but to praise God. That's why I think I mentioned it last time that when you are old enough or you have more years in your Christian walk, you have many, many, many experiences of the goodness and the greatness of God in your life. Maybe you have ups and downs in life, but you cannot help it but to remember that God is so good. And that God, that goodness of God will fuel your energy, will give you the motivation and the excitement to worship Him. And also the courage and the confidence that you know your current situation right now is just a moment because I know that God will deliver me. The trials in life, the tragedies in life, is just a moment because I know when I look back, I remember the goodness of God. That's why His loving kindness is better than life. 
And what he meditates here is that his goodness and his mercy. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, what do you think? What do you meditate? Are you meditating, pondering about, okay, Lord, I have $600 in my electric bill. It used to be 100 now 600 because the, the heater is on 24 hours right now because it's so hot, it's so cold. And I was surprised, how am I going to pay for this, Lord? And then there's another, the rent is due uh, this week. My tuition fee, I need to pay for this. I need to pay for that. Are we meditating on those things or are we meditating the goodness, the loving kindness of God in the night watches? In the middle of the night, are we meditating on him? Because if we are meditating, remembering the greatness of God in the night watch, in the middle of the night, I think you can say this in verse 7, for you have been my help. You've been helping me, Lord. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. It's like another metaphor for David, that the shadow of God's wing. Why, when we see this shadow of God's wings, it speaks of God's protection. Like in the scorching heat of the day, You are looking for a little shade to cover your skin or just to feel the the cool breeze of the wind because you are hiding under the shade, the shadow. And this is like an example that God is there to protect him or to protect you when there is a temptation or when there is a threat of harm. God is your shadow. His wing is like a shadow that will cover you. That's why he said in verse 8, my soul clings to you. This word is like cleaving, just like a husband and wife. The two will become one flesh. And David is saying here that my soul clings to you. I want to cleave to you. Your right hand upholds me. David is, has this vivid, rich imagination. Although God doesn't have any hands or feet or eyes, but it is an expression, like anthropomorphic expression, an expression wherein God has a hand, God has feet. Because it is like the right hand, the strong arms, is the one that protects and give him the security and refuge. We need to practice remembering the goodness of God. Not remembering our failures. It's good from time to time, just like when you're driving, look to your side mirror or your rear view mirror, but not dwelling there for a long time. But if you will dwell on something from the past, Dwell on the goodness, on the greatness, on the mercy and grace of God in your life. And if you will do that, if you will relish God, if you will rave for God, if you will remember God, His goodness, His loving kindness, you will end up rejoicing in God. So now in verse 9, But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. What it means here, because as I said, when we look back, it was written when he was running away from something, running away from the enemies, whether Saul or Absalom. David has this confidence that those who seek my life, God will destroy them. He's not rejoicing because God will destroy them. That's why he said in verse 11, but the king pertaining to himself will be glad. The king will rejoice in God. He's not rejoicing because his enemies are being destroyed by God, but he is rejoicing in God himself, who is the one who protects him. 
But the king will be glad. Everyone who swears by him will boast. Not swearing the word swear, but it's like putting their allegiance to God will boast. If your allegiance is before God, you will have this confidence. For the mouth of those who speak lies will be closed. Imagine this. David started by relishing God, by raving for God, remembering God, his goodness, and then he ended up rejoicing in God. Rejoicing in a sense that his thirst was quenched. His longing, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I'll seek you. My flesh, my, my soul longs for you. My flesh longs for you. But when we put this in context, as we close, when you go to God in prayer, hungering and thirsting for him, do you feel the satisfaction? Do you feel that I'm satisfied? My thirst was quenched. My hunger has been filled. Because the only one who can quench our soul is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is our soul quencher. Read with me as I close this in verse 35 of John chapter 7. And notice this. As Jesus said this, in verse 37, now on the day, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The irony of this is that it was on the last day of the great feast. Of course, when you are in this feast, Everyone is like groaning, oh, I'm so full. Oh, I have this, maybe I'm experiencing food coma. I ate a lot. I <laughs> drank a lot. And yet, Jesus is saying, he stood and cried out. He invited them. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he, obviously, he's pertaining about your soul's thir thirst. Because even though you are filled and satisfied physically, there will always be this discontent in you because your soul is not satisfied. That's why Jesus himself invited them and inviting you. If you are, maybe you have everything in life, but this satisfaction, soul satisfaction, he's inviting you, come to me. Come to me and drink. And what he's pertaining here is in verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost, or like the, his belly, being will flow rivers of living water. And it's pertaining to the availability, abundance of the Holy Spirit to those who will trust and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe right now, if you don't have the trust in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to come to him, to trust him, to believe in him, to surrender your all, your cares, your life to him, because he's the only one who can satisfy. And maybe right now you'll say, hey, Jim, I've been a Christian for so long, and yet I am not experiencing this abundance, this overflowing fountain of living water. Maybe you will doubt your salvation. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe you're right. Or maybe you are not relishing, raving for God. No, you're not remembering what he has done. You only remember what you have done for him. I, re I remember one time I prayed a sinner's prayer. I prayed that God, Jesus, come to my life. And maybe that's where you put your confidence. That's why you are still thirsting for him. Or you're not satisfied because you are remembering what you have done. You are not 
pondering, remembering what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. If your confidence of your relationship towards him is because of your good works or because of your response to the gospel presentation, the good news, it will not stand. It's like carbs that will not satisfy. You will have many of it or maybe all of the carbs in this world and it will not satisfy But if your dependence is what God, what Christ has done for you on the cross, when he died for you, when he was buried and rose again on the third day, if your confidence is in him, you will end up rejoicing because you know that you have this satisfaction in him. And there are times that's why maybe this passage in Psalm 63 is so dear to me because I'm thinking of, Lord, I don't have this urge, this thirst, this hunger for you. Help me. Give me this thirst or give me or satisfy me with this word of yours. You promise. That anyone who come to you will, satis- will be satisfied. Because from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And right now, if you are maybe dying of thirst spiritually, this is the best time for you to be filled. Best time for you and I to experience this living water, rivers of water, flowing, living water that will always satisfy. And I hope that you will take time to ponder, to think about what you have heard. I've been pondering this for more than a week now, and I, even though I feel tired, weary physically, but there is this living water flowing in my innermost being that I know he is the only one who can satisfy. Not anything, not anyone in this world can, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our soul quenchers. I want you to bow with me and reflect on what we have heard. And I would like to uh, call Stephen just to wrap it up and I am inviting you just to please think of what you have heard because I know that the Holy Spirit has the power to convict you of any sin that you want, that you need to confess. And in confessing your sin, I hope and pray that this will free you and that this will allow you to experience satisfaction and your thirst being quenched by him. Our Heavenly Father, this is where my work ends. But I believe that your work in the spirit was continuously working from the preparation of this message to the preaching of your message. That your Holy Spirit will continue to do his work. That he will continue to convict us of our sin. That will encourage us in this discouraging time that you lead us, Lord, on how we can practically apply what we have heard. It is you, Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, who will fill us. You said, how blessed it is for those who thirst and hunger for your righteousness, for they shall be filled. Fill us up, Lord. Continue to guide us. 
Continue to bless us so that we can be a blessing. Help us to grow more in the grace and likeness of you, O Lord Jesus Christ. For in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for the message today. And yeah, I, I think uh, throughout the the sermon, um, I don't know about you guys, but yeah, I, as Pastor Jim was preaching on on thirst, I I actually couldn't help but think of how thirsty I was, like physically. And um, thinking about it, I actually had to keep fighting myself to not connect the thirst with just a physical part because that's, that's the first thing that comes to my mind and it actually did make me thirsty but yeah obviously this aspect of of thirst is is a spiritual one so um you know i i find that uh, i guess the, the the r word that i might use to sort of sum this up is that um i need to redirect my mind my heart towards the the actual message the the actual meaning of the thirst and um you know that's that's definitely something that I think we all need to do as 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 like a challenge with you know how how much worries we have in this world um, that we do need to redirect ourselves towards God and and keep looking towards the Lord um, and yeah ho- hopefully from that then we'll be able to relish God pray for God remember and and rejoice in God as well so um, yeah thank you for that that reminder. <laughs> um, now let's close with uh, just some announcements. So, um, firstly, we just want to yeah just thank everyone for um, your, your your giving towards the church. Um, this is financially, um, and yeah, we for those here who are um, wanting to give uh, physically uh, t- today, we do have a, a, a little black box in the in the corner of the room, um, and for those who feel compelled to give. Um, online as well. Uh, there is um, a link to the details on our church website, I believe. So, um, yeah, please, um, you know, um, keep remembering the Lord in, in giving as well, giving back to Him. And, yeah, may He also bless you guys and, and bless His church through it. Uh, second announcement will be on um, Thursday. So, we, we, we have our usual uh, Zoom prayer meeting at 7:30 p.m. So, if you're able to make it, um, we'll, we'll send you a, a, a link um, before the prayer meeting starts, as, as usual. And yeah, we hope to see you all there um, in in prayer mode and uh, praying for one another and just just sort of you know journeying with each other and being in each other's lives um, on on an online platform anyway. And two weeks from now, on the 25th of July, th- there's also going to be a Southern Cross uh, team meeting. So, um, yeah, the, the agenda for that will be talking about the Southern Cross life groups. And um, I'm assuming it's to, to you know, plan for that and, and, and inform of, of, of how to get things going and launched. So, uh, on the, after church on Sunday... Uh, for those who are here, if you can please, um, yes, yeah, stay for that meeting if, if if that's relevant to you, and please bring a plate to share as well um, for the 25th, so that we can all have lunch fellowship together. So yeah, once again, thank you all for um, for your time, for for your generosity in 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 giving, and also your encouragement towards one another. Um, and yeah, I'll I'll close in prayer now as well before we. Um, have a chance to, to stay around and, and hang and, and chat to one another. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you that it's a it's a Sunday, Lord. Um, we know that um, that worship is what you deserve, and yeah, we just thank you, Lord, that we can worship you and remember you in in this way, Heavenly Father. Uh, Father, help us to continue to be challenged by um, Pastor Jim's message, and yeah, may may our thirst be towards you um, and yeah we're able to apply these practical elements that Pastor Jim was preaching about in into our lives this week and beyond we just continue to pray for the safety of our um, our state our, our, our nation Lord um, pray that you continue to, to, to protect us and yeah may may your will be done in in helping all of us to um, yeah keep 
faithfully looking to you in this time, Lord God. Um, and yeah, continue to keep us safe and well. So we just pray, Father, as we head into the rest of this day, be, be with us all, uh, keep teaching us and reminding us of your word and, and your goodness in our lives. So we yeah, thank you again, and we lift to you all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.